I'm Tommaso. I'm responsible of the native lab, which is the um, training division of managing composites and is dedicated mainly to yeah, spread knowledge related to, to composites. And yeah, we do that through webinars like today's, um, but also for courses and, and other initiatives. So yeah, feel free to check out our, our webpage. And, and yeah, that will be it. Mami will introduce himself in a minute. So I won't say anything, otherwise I'll be taking away the, the surprise. I see people are greeting us in the chat. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. I see the numbers are still going up slightly, but yes, I think we don't have we don't have a lot of time. We tr will try to make it in one hour, so it will be around forty five minutes uh, explanation about natural fibers, and then fifteen minutes Q and A. So, Mohammed, I think I'll I'll leave I'll leave I leave it up to you. I'll be silencing myself and, and disappearing, and well. Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks, Mohamed, for being here and enjoy the webinar, everyone. Okay, um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. So uh, I don't know, can you see the screen now? Yes, I can perfectly see it. Okay, so um, Okay, um, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, such a pleasure to be here with you uh, this evening. My name is uh, Mohamed Vidani. I would like to thank Tommaso and the Native Lab for the invitation. Uh, so before we get started with the presentation, uh, let me just uh, ask you to uh, grab your phone and uh, we, we're gonna be using Menti. It's an interactive like, uh, platform for questions and polls. So uh, if you can just either like uh, type in the website menti.com and then enter the, the code. Okay, let me just show it to you. So, or you can just scan this QR code and enter this number uh, so that we can go ahead and start uh, like uh, using some polls, okay. Okay, so we're still waiting for more people to join. So, uh, so we're going for the first poll. So uh, please let us know how many webinars of the Native Lab have you joined uh, so far? Okay, so uh, you want me to keep the code? So let's wait until everyone has the code. Okay, so it's 32827457. Okay, so just type menti.com using your cell phone or your internet browser. Okay, or you can scan the QR code. Okay. So, uh, so far we're having like uh, people who are regularly participating in events. We're having four have been attending more than five or two to five. Wow. So you have two have attended more than 10. <laughs> okay. So I think we're still getting more responses. Okay, so I think uh, we have some lawyer participants who have been attending for a while and uh, we're having some like uh, newcomers to this webinar series. I hope it would be like a rewarding experience for your time. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's move to the next poll. Please let us know uh, what's your experience with natural fibers. Uh, I mean, do you have any experience a bit or uh, you're quite good in it, uh, or even 
for having professionals. I have recognized some of the names and the faces in the attendees. So I know we're having some like uh, professionals in the uh, participants. But you know, it's always good to know who's attending so that we can like slightly tailor the content to the like our audience. Okay. So, uh, so that's good. I think like I, I felt most of the people might not be quite familiar, but we're still having like uh, the biggest proportion. Uh, they have a little bit of experience. So th this would be good enough. So I will try to build it from the ground up so that people who are not really familiar with this can still uh, follow what we're going through. Okay, so, um, so let's go back to the presentation. Okay. Okay, so as I said, my name is Mohammed Midani. So I'm an assistant professor of materials engineering at the German University in Cairo. And I'm also an adjunct assistant professor uh, at the Wilson College of Textiles, North Carolina State University. And this is where I did my master's degree in textile technology and management, as well as my PhD in fiber and polymer science. And I'm also the managing partner of a consulting company called Intexive, which is specialized in uh, textiles and composites. Uh, and I usually teach courses and classes related to fiber reinforced composites and management of new product development. And uh, my research is mostly focused on uh, natural fiber composites as well as uh, sustainable product development. Um, and uh, I'm one of the co-inventors of a new type of natural fiber, which is called palm fill, which is considered uh, the world's first textile fibers and reinforcements that are extracted from the byproducts of pruning of date palm. And I will try to go through it at the very end of the presentation. Okay. So as most of you know, like every year, thousands of composite parts end up in landfills, including those gigantic wind turbine blades. And composite manufacturers are facing increasing pressure related to the sustainability of their products and their end of life options. Uh, and many of the composite industry players nowadays are interested in natural fiber composites. Uh, however, you know, our unfamiliarity with this newcomer to the composite industry is preventing us from like widely using it. So the purpose of today's webinar is to bridge this gap and to provide a practical a guide to the industrial utilization of natural fiber composites. Okay, so let's get started. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Okay, so to define what is natural fiber composites, so these are composite materials with the reinforcing phase uh, made up of natural fibers, whereas the matrix phase could be like um, polymer, synthetic polymer, or even bio-based polymer. So why should we use natural fibers? Why is it, in, I mean, what's the, the benefits of using natural fibers as a reinforcement for composites? So first, they are sustainable. They're obtained from renewal, renewable resources. They are carbon dioxide neutral. I mean, they can reduce the carbon dioxide emissions by more than 60% compared to glass fiber composites. They are biodegradable and, they're end, and at their end of life, it can be recycled, okay? Also, it's lightweight and safe. So they, their density is almost half the density of glass fiber and they do not require any special personal protective equipment while handling them. And they are non-abrasive to the machine parts. And more importantly, they are high performance. They have specific tensile properties equivalent to those of glass fibers. They have thermal and acoustical insulation even higher than glass and carbon fibers. Okay, so what about the market status for natural fiber composites? So 
uh, when we look at the market size, we will often see in like market reports, the, the, the market size is reported as um, like biocomposites. And the term biocomposites, it encompasses both like um, wood plastic composites as well as natural fiber composites. Um, and to be honest, natural fiber composites only constitute a small fraction of this market. So in 2018, the total market for, for biocomposites in Europe was 470,000 tons. However, only 9% of this market was made up of natural fiber composites. So it's in the range of like 42,000 tons. And most of these like 42,000 tons, they end up being used in automotive compression molding applications. And the automotive is one of the oldest markets for, uh, for natural fiber composites. I mean, dating back to Henry's Ford hemp car in the 1940s, coming all the way until today's more modern vehicles. And the most common parts that are made of natural fiber composites in the automotive, which is commercially used, is the interior, interior door panels, the parcel shelves, the trunk liners, and some other interior components. However, we're seeing companies like Porsche and McLaren who are pushing the limits and they're trying to use this new material in more like structural applications like seat frames and seat backs in exterior applications like in uh, like body panels. Uh, but to be honest, this still remains the most important commercial application for natural fiber composites. Uh, but also nowadays we're seeing many like uh, engineers, companies, uh, researchers, designers, and even architects who are interested in natural fiber composites. This building that is uh, located in the Netherlands, it has been, uh, the facade of this building has been entirely made of hemp fiber and bio-based epoxy. And recently this year, uh, two uh, natural fiber composite pavilions were built in, uh, in Germany. The first one is called Live Mats. Uh, it was made from uh, flax fiber and bio-based uh, epoxy using like a moldless uh, filament winding process. Uh, the second one is called Biomat. It was made from hemp and uh, flax and bio-based epoxy to make poltruded rods. So the rods are like those long rods are made with the poltrusion process. Um, and also this is another interesting application. So it's a Danish company that is called uh, Project Ticken. Okay, so they are making hard case composite travel bags uh, and they are selling it uh, online. I mean, the, this is a commercial product that they're selling. You can buy it for almost 450 US dollar. Okay, this is another interesting application. It's a company called Java Materials in the UK. They are trying to commercialize natural fiber composite substrates for printed circuit boards. Uh, also, this is another application, uh, interesting application for an interesting sport. So this is an e-scooter that was built by an Italian company called Ycom. Okay, it was made of flax and bio-based epoxy for the first uh, e-scooter race that took place also earlier this year. Um, and this is a company that you need to keep an eye on. It's a, it's a German company, it's called Green Boats. Uh, and this company is actually pushing the limits of natural fiber composites. And they are taking it to new horizons that have never been realized before. This is their iconic uh, base sailor. It's called the Flax 27. It's made of uh, flax fiber and, and uh, bio-based epoxy. And recently this summer, they have installed the first natural fiber composite nasal over the uh, wind tower in the uh, in Netherlands. And this is part of like a test program that is intended to study 
how this new material will perform in the wind energy uh, industry. So let's go to Menti. Okay, um, we're having a new another like uh, poll. So from what we've covered so far, you will see that. I mean, it seems that natural fiber composites are still in their early adoption stages, despite of their outstanding properties. So the question here is, what's holding them back? Why aren't they diffusing into the mass market? What's preventing this? Okay, so please go to Menti. Okay, let me open. Okay. And uh, let us know what you think. What's the major barrier to the widespread use of natural fiber composite in the mass market? Is it price? Is it performance? Is it supply, compatibility, or knowledge? <clears throat> okay, so we're still getting more responses. Um, like so far, people are voting for performance. Uh, some like we're having equal share for price, compatibility, knowledge. Um, people think that supply is not a big deal. Okay, so uh, so I think now we're having like the vote. Most of people have voted, but seems so far that people agrees that it's a problem with the performance. Uh, some people think it's knowledge, but. Let's move back to go back to our presentation. Okay. Okay. So the question was, what's holding them back? So uh, I, I, I intended to include this part because I feel it's most important part in the presentation because there are still some misconceptions about why is it not really used widely in the composite industry? Okay. So the most, I mean, most of the responses are correct. So except for the performance, okay? They have really very good performance, equivalent to their glass fiber counterparts. But the most like uh, important factor, I would say, is the lack of compatibility. As you know, like, high, like natural fibers are hydrophilic. I mean, they love water and they are not compatible with like synthetic like polymer matrix, uh, which is hydrophobic. And this is one of the, like, the, the problems. Also, they have low thermal stability. So they cannot be heated beyond like 200 degrees C. So their use, especially with like thermoplastic matrix is limited to low melt thermoplastics like polyolefins, including polypropylene and polyethylene, okay? Also, they have poor bonding with the polymer matrix, simply like the, like the surface functional groups of the fiber, they don't get along much with the surface functional groups of the polymer matrix, so, so they don't react, they don't create this good bond. Also, this is another reality. There is a global limited supply of natural fibers. It cannot be compared with glass fiber, for example. Uh, and this is something that cannot be tolerated for specific industries. Think about like the automotive industry or the wind turbine industry who have like very strict supply chain. So this is another limitation. Also, they have high variability in properties. So they are natural materials. They suffer from natural variability. And this is probably something that we as engineers and researchers, we don't feel comfortable with. We want something that we, we are 100% sure of their properties. We want to have higher confidence in this material. Uh, so this is another problem. Also, another limitation is that most of the natural fibers used in the reinforcements are considered hard fibers. So they are coarse, they are stiff. Uh, they cannot be easily processed into a textile form using like the conventional spinning and weaving methods for cotton. So compatibility is a big issue, okay? The second problem is with complexity. And this relates to how easy it is to 
use natural fiber composites or how complex it is. And I personally think it's easy, it's not complex, but the problem is that it's different. It's different from, from what we're used to with like glass fibers and carbon fibers. So this limited experience and knowledge, you know, is limiting this wide spread. I mean, so like manufacturers, they, they feel more comfortable using what they are used to versus like learning about new, new materials and how to use it. Okay, also another important factor is the trialability. It's how easy it is to try this material, to get access and experiment this new material. And due to the fact that most of the composite manufacturers are located in like countries like Western Europe, in the United States, in Japan, okay? Whereas most of the like vegetable fibers or the natural fibers are grown elsewhere. They are grown in Southeast Asia. So this, you know, geographic barrier is creating a supply chain problem. I mean, you know, like, so composite manufacturers just can't get their hand easily on those new fibers just to try them, okay? With an exception of flax, flax is already grown in big quantities in France. This is, so this explains why flax is the major fiber used in natural fiber composites. And the last factor is the communicability. And this explains how easy it is to communicate the benefits of natural fiber composites. And due to the fact that most of the important like benefits of natural fiber composites are indirect benefits, okay? Intangible benefits related to like biodegradability, uh, like uh, re reduction of carbon footprint. While there are like, I mean, there, there, there are certain, you know, this like value proposition cannot, would, might not be convincing to some of the customers who are more interested in performance or, or who are more interested in uh, like uh, price. So these are also things that we need to consider. We need to communicate the, the direct benefits. What's the performance of this material? Could it be produced in a cost-effective manner? Okay, I know I took some time in this like slide, but I think, as I said, it's the most important part of the presentation. You know, it's just about like defining the problem. And if we know, if we clearly understand what's the problem, then perhaps we can easily find solutions and overcome those barriers and end up having more and more uh, like uh, adoption of natural fiber composites. Okay, so now let's um, move on and see what do we have in our natural fiber reinforcement toolbox. Okay, so generally natural fibers are classified into like vegetable fibers and animal fibers. And they can be further classified based on the part of the uh, the part from which they are extracted or obtained. So for vegetable fibers, we will have like bast fibers. And these are the fibers that are extracted from the stem of the plant. And we have leaf fibers, and these are the fibers extracted from the leaves of the plant. And we have seed fibers and we have fruit fibers, okay? Whereas for the animal fibers, we have wool and hair, and these are the fibers obtained from livestock animals. And we have silk, which is the fiber obtained from insects. And we have feathers, and these are fibers obtained from uh, birds. But we will find that most of the natural fiber reinforcements are plant-based. So we will only be focusing on the vegetable fibers, okay? None of these are really considered for uh, reinforcement. Okay, so for the best fibers, we will find that we have a very uh, interesting fiber, it's called jute. And this is a fiber extracted from uh, the stem, long stems of the jute plant. And this is a fiber that is widely grown in Bangladesh. So it's mostly obtained from Bangladesh. Another important fiber, which is the flax. So the fibers are extracted from those small stems. And archaeological evidences confirm that flax is the first fiber that has been used in human history. Uh, another interesting fiber is the hemp. Uh, 
Uh, however, hemp belongs to the cannabis family, and due to its association with the marijuana, there has been a wide uh, ban on cultivating it worldwide. However, there are recently increasing interest in this type of fiber, and there are another like vast fibers less popular like the kanaf and the uh, rami, okay? Uh, examples of leaf fibers include the sisal, okay? And the fibers are extracted from the leaves of this cactus that belongs to the agave family. Another uh, interesting like uh, leaf fiber, it's called the abaca or the manila hemp, which is, obtained, which is mainly grown in the Philippines, okay? Uh, the fibers are obtained or extracted from the leaves, the pseudostem leaves of the abaca uh, tree, which is known as the Mosa textilis. It's a close relative to the banana. Uh, and there are another or other types of leaf fibers that are gaining popularity nowadays, like the pineapple fibers and the banana fibers. Okay, uh, for the seed fibers, uh, cotton is the most popular mostly grown in China and India. Uh, there's another, I mean, beautiful uh, seed fiber. It's called the Kapok, which is native to Central and South America. But mostly seed fibers are, are not considered, they are like fine, like uh, soft fibers. So they're not suitable for reinforcements. Uh, fruit fibers include the most popular type of fruit fiber is the quar. And these are the fibers surrounding the coconut husk and mainly produced in India, okay? And the last type of uh, uh, fruit fiber is the oil palm. And these are also fibers obtained from the husk surrounding the oil palm fruit. Uh, and uh, I mean, this fiber, it hasn't realized any commercial value yet. So it's still in their early commercialization stages. Okay. so. So now we know more about the sources of our natural fiber reinforcements. So this is like a free natural fibers photo library that I'm sharing with you. You can scan the QR code to access this library. It includes more than 20 natural fibers in high resolution that you can use for free for um, non-commercial purpose. I actually took this photos myself and I thought it's good to share it with people. You know, just to get get like a feel of how those different fibers might look like, even if you can't touch them, but at least you know, just by looking at them, you can get a sense how soft, how hard, uh, what's the color. Okay, uh, so this is an important slide. Okay, uh, it just in includes like a summary of properties of the most important vegetable fibers. So I won't go into the details, but I thought it's important to put it uh, so that when I share the slides with you, you can have it as a good reference. So it includes like comparison of different properties, including physical, chemical, and mechanical properties. Okay. Um, so generally, if we look at the force, uh, at the first four fibers, the flax, the kinaf, the hemp, and the jute. So these are bast fibers. And bast fibers, I mean, they are like intended, they are designed by nature to be a reinforcement to the plant stem, you know? So, so they tend to have smaller diameters and they tend to have higher stiffness So, that, so they, because they are intended to stiffen this plant stem. So that's why there are higher interest in those type of fibers as a reinforcement, okay? Um, the other two types like the sisal and the abaca, they are leaf fibers. And leaf fibers are slightly different story. They are designed by nature to be pipelines, okay? So they're intended to transport the moisture and the nutrients to the different parts of the plant, okay? So, uh, so they, the fibers tend to be like hollow. They tend to be coarse, thick fibers. Uh, so uh, that's one thing, but they're, their young's modulus would be slightly lower than bast fiber, even though they have high, high strength. So their strength is in the same range of like bast fibers, but their modulus is lower because they have higher uh, break elongation. So for applications that requires like high toughness, so these would be like the fibers of choice, abaca, 
is an amazing fiber. It's the strongest natural fiber ever. And it has very high like uh, uh, area under the tensile stress strain curve. So it absorbs large amount of energy before failure. Also size cell. If I'm looking for something that uh, stiff and can provide high rigidity, so vast fiber would be the choice. Uh, Quar is a different story. <laughs> Quar, uh, it's a coarse fiber as well. Uh, it has like an intermediate tensile strength, but it's a ductile fiber. No, it has, it can deform like uh, plastically up to 40%. And this is something very unique. I mean, most of like the natural vegetable fibers, they are very stiff. They have very low, like they, they, they deform elastically only they don't deform plastically except for quartz so it can be used in applications that requires higher ductility okay so just to get like an idea of how different fibers like are different from each others so the question here what makes them different i mean if they are all plant based if they are all made of cellulose what makes them different uh, i mean one factor is the fiber shape or the fiber morphological shape, including the cross section, the surface feature, we will find that most of the vegetable fibers, they do have lumens, center hollow lumens, but these lumens in like bast fibers, they tend to be very small uh, in like, uh, like uh, leaf fibers, like the sisal, as I said, they are like pipelines, so the, the, the lumens tend to be larger lumens. Uh, so, uh, and, and by the way, I mean, th this is not just one single fiber. If we, if we look closer, so, so it's, it, it's called fiber bundle, okay? And each one of these cells is, consider, is considered an elemental fiber or elemental fibril. And it's, it depends on how, ex like how efficient the extraction process. Uh, and, and so depending on the efficiency, we can split this bundle and break it down into smaller bundle or even break it down into elemental fibril. And same thing with the flax. So flax is also made of fiber bundles. And as we like uh, do the retting and do the extraction, so those elemental fibrils tend to split and like debond from each other. This is why flax have like, uh, like small fiber size. Okay. so. Fiber shape, fiber cross section is an important factor. Other factors that dictates the performance of natural fibers include, uh, you know, like uh, imperfections or or like defects, the presence of defects. Uh, other factors include like the purity of the precursor. Do they have high cellulose purity? Are there some impurities in the structure? And several other factors. Okay, uh, so. Let's go to Menti, okay? So please go to the website and enter the code. So we're like uh, doing another poll, okay? Okay, so from your experience, what's the most produced vegetable fibers after cotton? What do you think is the most produced vegetable fiber after cotton? Okay, so people think flax is the has the largest production after cotton. Uh, we're having people who are voting for jute. Some are voting for hemp. Okay. Okay, so we're still getting more responses. Okay. <laughs> okay. So it seems that flax is very popular. Uh, I mean, just because you know, like uh, it's it's widely used in like fashion and like uh, in apparel and clothing, so people are familiar with flax. Uh, but jute, for instance, it's 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 not used in like uh, like uh, fashion applications. Mostly used in technical applications like Haitian fabrics, like making like ropes and twines. Uh, but seems that like we're very close to the correct answer. So let's look at. What's the right answer now? Okay. Right. So these are just some market realities. Okay. So the largest produced 
Vegetable fiber is cotton or natural fiber is cotton, almost 26 million tons produced annually. Jute ranks second after cotton, 3.6 million tons produced annually, followed by coir, followed by flax. So only 860,000 tons produced annually. If we keep going, we will find that hemp comes in, at the very end of the list, only 61,000 tons produced every year. And I feel really, uh, I, I feel very ironic. I mean, how people are so much interested in hemp, despite that there's very limited supply. Uh, whereas, you know, like, <laughs> like fibers like jute, it's, it already has very interesting properties comparable to hemp, and it's available in much larger quantities and more importantly, affordable price. So, you know, whenever we're having limited supply, we're having expensive prices, but here we're having abundance in supply. So we're having affordable price. So it becomes really ironic. I, I still don't get why, why people are not like interested in jute. And this is just like uh, a table that shows like the world production of vegetable fibers over the years from 2010 to 2018 and showing the compound annual growth rate of those fibers. We'll see that jute is a fast growing fiber. Flax is also growing fast. Hemp is growing fast, but you know, after all the market size or the total production is, I mean, it cannot be compared to something like jute or even coir. Okay. And if we look at the world production of vegetable fibers on the, on the world map, this might explain why people are interested perhaps in, in hemp or flax. So we will find that more than 70%, 70 percent, 70 percent of the total production of vegetable fibers are coming from Southeast Asia, including major production of coir fibers from India, major production of jute fibers from Bangladesh. Okay, yet we still have like a considerable amount of vegetable fibers coming from France and Belgium, which is flax. So flax is a popular like commodity in France. So this explains why, I mean, people are more interested in flax. Uh, part of it could be like supply chain, part of it could be political or even national interest. This is a national commodity that people are more interested in like a local resource uh, versus like importing like uh, fibers. So, um, Okay, so, so now we know our natural fiber reinforcements. But before we start converting those reinforcements into like composites, there's an intermediate stage in between like the fiber and the composites, which is called the preform, the textile preform. So the fibers have to be like converted into in a proper textile preform to deliver the desired characteristics or performance. So now we will look at what, what preforms do we have, okay? Uh, and most of the coming preforms that I will discuss are available for commercial supply by Easy Composites UK. You can order them online or you can order them by phone, okay? So the first and the most important type of architecture or preform structure for natural fiber composite is the non-woven structure. And as you know, I mean, non-woven is made of like uh, randomly laid fibers that are uh, mechanically bonded into a fiber web, okay? So, I mean, they tend to have like lower mechanical performance because there's no like uh, defined, defined like uh, orientation. Also due to the random nature, you cannot achieve like fiber alignment or fiber packing and consequently high fiber volume fraction. So this is why, I mean, it's, it's limited to intermediate performance, but in terms of price, it's almost half of the price or even less than like uh, other structures like unidirectional or woven. Uh, also the most commonly used uh, natural fiber preforms are, as I said, is non-woven and, in this case, it's a non-woven that is uh, blended with 
polypropylene fiber. So it's 50% natural fiber and 50% polypropylene fiber. And this is like the standard used in the automotive industry where the, the mat is considered like a dry pre-preg and it's taken directly to the compression molding and it's just compression molded and the composite is, uh, is ready to use. Okay, uh, but it's still, I mean, this, for instance, th th this type, it's uh, like 100% flax non-woven. So you need still to add like, uh, like something like uh, polyester resin or other laminating uh, resin like epoxy. Okay, uh, the second type of reinforcement is the woven reinforcement. And as you know, like uh, woven, it provides much higher performance because of the ability, you know, to have higher fiber compaction, higher alignment, higher packing, higher fiber volume fraction. And it provides reinforcement in like a cross direction, like biaxial reinforcement in the X and the Y direction. Uh, and another important feature of woven uh, reinforcements, they provide an, uh, like a visually appealing surface layer, you know, like so that the, the pattern or the texture of the weave pattern is something that people are looking for in their uh, like natural fiber composite. Uh, and as you know, I mean, there are different weights of like woven preforms. There are like this one, for instance, is 200 gram per square meter. This one is 500 gram per square meter. So it depends on like the application and the purpose. Uh, so how many layers do you want to have? Like, like lighter, lighter reinforcements have thinner layer. These are like thicker layers, uh, thicker or, or heavier like woven fabrics. They tend to have like more visible uh, weave pattern. And these are both twill, twill uh, woven fabrics, two by two twill fabrics. And as you know, I mean, the twill uh, really has a good like uh, compromise between uh, like uh, good moldability, it's easy to mold, easy to conform to the shape of the mold. And meanwhile, it has very good stability during handling. So it's not, not easy to distort during the handling process. Uh, another important reinforcement is the unidirectional tape. This is uh, like, a th these are tapes in the, that have wet up to 40 centimeters. Uh, those unidirectional tapes are slightly different from like uh, carbon and uh, glass tapes because they are made directly from fibers. So they are not converted into yarns and then tapes. These are spreaded fibers that are converted directly into like uh, a unidirectional preform. So one aspect, they don't have any twist. They don't have any interlacement. Okay, so the waviness of the weave is not present, so they can provide the highest mechanical performance with, with the highest fiber volume fraction. But uh, the only limitation, I would say that they are delicate. They need to be handled with care. It's very easy to distort during handling. So, so, you, so you can see here, for instance, there's part of it that is distorted uh, because there's nothing holding like uh, those fibers except for like the interfiber friction and some adhes adhesion forces between the fibers. Uh, these are also made of flax, 200 grams of flax. Uh, another type of like unidirectional preforms, it's called a cross stitch, but honestly, the technical term is weftless woven composites, uh, weftless woven preforms. Uh, so these are just like regular woven preforms. If we get look closer at the preform, it's made of like uh, warp warp yarns, okay. And the weft yarns are we're using very small, very small weft yarns at large intervals. So the proportion of the weft yarns, with respect or compared to the warp yarns, is negligible. So it's predominantly warp yarns, and the weft yarns are just intended to hold the, the warp yarns in place. So there's not much of like interlacement uh, because of the wool, the, the, the weave. Uh, so it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's another like good option. It provides very high performance. Uh, and recently we have been seeing several companies who have been developing pre-impregnated uh, natural fiber preforms for composite applications. 
uh, including easy composites and uh, composite evolution. Okay. So uh, this is made of like a unidirectional fibers. Uh, and, you know, because of the like uh, impregnation with the resin, so, so it's more stable, it doesn't distort easily, and it comes with a protective polyethylene film. Uh, okay, so, so now we know the reinforcements, now we know the different architectures. So let's get, take, take a look about like, what do we have for the compatible matrix system? So we will find that most of those reinforcements, they can be used with the conventional matrix systems, including like polyester and epoxy. However, there are some like uh, companies that are developing very specialized formulations for this specific purpose. Generally, when we look at the polymeric matrix materials, they are classified into thermoplastics and thermal sets. Uh, for the synthetic thermoplastics, the most important thermoplastic is the polypropylene, okay? This is the most important thermoplastic for uh, natural fiber composites, okay? It's available as fibers, it's available as powder, as sheets, so it can be, it's very versatile, can be easily used, it has low melting temperature, requires less energy, uh, very fast curing cycles, it doesn't cure, I mean, it solidifies by cooling, okay? Uh, another important bio-based thermoplastic is the PLA, okay, the polylactic acid. Uh, by far, this is the, like the, the, the major thermoplastic, bio-based thermoplastic with like acceptable mechanical properties. Uh, but as most of you know, it's very expensive. But if we want to develop like a fully bio-based, biodegradable composite, so probably PLA is the option of choice, okay? Uh, for thermosets, as many of you know, like we can use epoxy, unsaturated polyester, uh, vinyl ester, okay? So these can all be used with um, like uh, natural fibers. However, recently there has been like an increasing interest in bio-based uh, like uh, resin. Uh, I wouldn't say bio-based. I think bio-based is the wrong term. It's partly bio-based. Okay, so it's not fully bio-based. So these are epoxy resin that are uh, have part bio or part made of uh, like plant oils such as uh, soy oil, linseed oil, and sunflower oil. So they are partly bio-based. So let's look at some of the like commercial bio-based resins that are available in the market. So these are all, so these are also like uh, bio-based uh, epoxy that are supplied commercially from easy composites, okay? The LB2 is a laminating bioresin, epoxy bioresin. Uh, the LB, the IB2 is uh, an infusion. So it's more suitable for like uh, vacuum assisted resin transfer molding and resin infusion applications. Okay, and uh, both of them, they have like uh, bio-based content up to 38%. And uh, I mean, this percentage of bio-based resin, it can provide like, uh, like uh, epoxy resin with equivalent like performance, like just the fully synthetic epoxy resin. And the price is almost like 30% more expensive than the regular poly uh, epoxy. Uh, this is another like uh, important company that is making like uh, bio-based epoxy. It's a French company called the uh, Sicomon. Uh, it produces uh, like a brand called Green Poxy. Uh, I mean, they, they have like a wide portfolio of this Green Poxy uh, with bio-based content that can reach up to 50%. They have gel coats, bio-based gel coats. They have uh, like uh, certain green poxy with the flame retardancy, but the, the ones with the best performance is the green poxy 33 with 35% bio-based content. Okay, so now let's look at how can we fabricate the uh, natural fiber composites. So, um, I mean, generally 
<laughs> like natural fiber composites are manufacturing using like the conventional composite fabrication methods. But you know, after all, the like the processing parameters have to be optimized for this certain application. But before we move on and start discussing the different like uh, processing methods, we need just to look at some important considerations before the fabrication. So the first and the most important consideration is that we need to dry the fibers, okay? Or at least make sure that the supplier is providing a dry fiber, okay? Because as I said, I mean, natural fibers, they have like natural tendency to absorb moisture from air and their moisture content in the like normal like uh, conditions can reach up to eight or 9%. And this would significantly lower the performance of the composite. It can reach like up to uh, 30 or 35% reduction in the mechanical performance. Uh, this is something that we need to avoid. Uh, another important consideration is that if my reinforcement is not like, like uh, initially designed for this final application, it's not, so I'm buying like, uh, let's say a jute, fabric from any place, but it's not intentionally, you know, developed for composite application, probably it will include spinning and processing lubricants that needs to be removed. And those lubricants, they act as, you know, as a surface barrier. So they, they create a barrier between like the fiber surface and the matrix surface. So it significantly lower the adhesion with the matrix. Okay. So uh, so if this is the case, we need to wash the fabrics, we need to, or scour it, and we need to thoroughly dry it before using. Another important consideration is the use of the compatibilizers, okay? And as most of you know, I mean, like natural fibers, they are not like perfectly compatible with like uh, polymer, like synthetic polymer matrix. Uh, so we need to use coupling agents or compatibilizers uh, to improve this adhesion. The most important coupling agent for uh, like polypropylene matrix is the malic anhydride. And in some cases, the polypropylene is sold, uh, I mean, as functionalized with malic anhydride, it's called the malleated polypropylene. Uh, for the therm thermosetting matrix, silane is the widely used uh, coupling agent. Okay, so, what we need to achieve is a good bonding between interfacial bonding between the fiber and the matrix. So this is an untreated or like a composite, natural fiber composite with no couplings. Okay, so we're not using coupling Asian. So you will see that under loading what happens, the fiber easily debond from the matrix. And as we continue loading, this fiber will be pulled out, easily pulled out, out of the matrix. So, so we're not having so so we're not having good load transfer. So as you know, I mean, the matrix is responsible for transferring the load. So if there is no like good interface, so the matrix will not be able to transfer the load, and consequently, it will result in lower mechanical performance versus a composite, a natural fiber composite with the coupling agent. So we're having an excellent adhesion between the fiber and the matrix. The fiber is locked inside the matrix. It's not allowed to pull out of the matrix. So here we have very good load transfer efficiency. Okay, so for the composite manufacturing techniques, again, the most important commercial technique is the compression molding. And as I said, the, the material that is widely used in the composite industry is uh, natural fiber, thermoplastic, non-woven with 50% natural fiber and 50% polypropylene in a non-woven structure. And they're mainly compression <clears throat> molded. Uh, I mean, it's cost effective. It's, uh, you know, like, uh, especially like with thermoplastics, like the industry, uh, it's interested in this because of its like short production cycle. So you can easily like compress, fabric, like consolidate and then solidify quickly and so on. Uh, 
so that's why you can it can be produced as mass production. Uh, other techniques that is also suitable for especially like uh, larger structures that perhaps are produced in smaller quantities is the vacuum assisted resin transfer molding. Uh, so it's mainly suited like in applications like in the marine and other like applications that requires less number of parts to be produced. Also resin transfer molding is another important technique, especially if the part requirement or I need to have a part that has like a two side surface finish. I have to have good surface finish on both sides. So resin transfer molding would definitely be uh, the process of choice. Uh, it provides high fiber volume fraction up to like 60% because of the cons high consolidation pressure. Uh, and it's suited for like, I would say like large production quantities, uh, but still like for small parts. Uh, okay, so now let's move on and talk about some of the like recent trends or future trends in the manufacturing of natural fiber composites. So recently there has been very high interest in utilizing agricultural residues as a feedstock for extracting fibers. Uh, they can provide, you know, larger supply, uh, more economically effective, more affordable fibers, uh, not just for the composite reinforcements, but even for like the fashion and the clothing industry. And this is uh, our recent innovation, palm fill, which is considered uh, the, the first textile fibers and reinforcements that are extracted from the, uh, like the, the, the fruit stalks and the front stalks of the date palm. Uh, and those fibers have very interesting properties comparable to other uh, natural or vegetable fiber reinforcements. Uh, you can learn more about the fiber. It's uh, at the, the website palmfill.com. And we're currently like uh, starting to build uh, or soon we start. We will start to build a pilot plant here in Egypt, and consequently start scaling up into uh, large or full commercial scale production. Uh, these are some interesting resources for people who are interested in natural fibers. Some organizations, some like uh, companies, like the International Natural Fiber Organization, the World Association of Natural Fiber Research, and so on. So. You can look them up. Uh, also, this is uh, an important directory. This is the first uh, natural fiber composite directory. It includes uh, like fiber suppliers, uh, converters, composite manufacturers. So you can also visit their website, flaxandhempdirectory.com. Uh, also, this is a recommended handbook. Uh, it's, a, it's a book that we have recently published. It's called The Manufacturing or Manufacturing Automotive Components from Sustainable Natural Fiber Composites. And uh, I, I would claim that it it's, a, it's a good guidebook for people who are interested in this area. Uh, and I'm not marketing it. I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, giving it to you for free. Okay, so you can download the free reprint for personal use from this QR code. Okay. Uh, so I'll just wait a second if you're still like scanning the QR code. And anyways, I will be sharing the slides with you so you can even later just scan the QR code. Uh, and uh, I mean, before I conclude, <laughs> I would like to say that, you know, uh, like natural fibers are emerging as sustainable alternatives to man-made fibers. They have like outstanding environmental benefits. Their performance is equivalent to glass fiber composites, yet there are still certain challenges and obstacles facing them and preventing them from diffusing into the mass market. Uh, however, <laughs> we are seeing companies, we're seeing researchers who are pushing the limits, trying to overcome those obstacles. We're seeing companies making uh, like off the shelf reinforcements that are ready to use similar to like man-made reinforcements. We're seeing companies making like uh, specialized resin formulations for natural fibers. Uh, we are seeing researchers who are developing 
uh, like new types of natural fibers for this specific application. So I strongly believe that the future is green and with the renewed interest in, uh, in bio-based materials, I, I believe that uh, natural fibers will prevail. So uh, with that, I conclude. I would like to thank you so much for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, if you want to learn more about my work, you can visit my personal website or you can email me at msmidani at ncsu.edu. Thank you so much. Uh, now let's move on to the uh, Q&A, okay? So let's go back to Menti, okay? So uh, just go to Menti and enter this code um, and type in any question you, you have, okay? Okay, so, so far we have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one, which books can be recommended to read about natural fiber? Uh, I already answered this. I'm providing this book. It's called the uh, Manufacturing Automotive Components from Sustainable Natural Fiber Composites. Uh, it's not limited to automotive, but since automotive is the most important end, end use, so this is why this book has like uh, more of like a, a bias towards automotive industry. Uh, it's a short book. It's a, it's a more practical guide. It's not like a textbook. It's a practical guide with up-to-date information. Okay. So, uh, so the second question, uh, do you have an overview of suppliers? Uh, I mean, personally, I don't have an overview, but uh, I already provided some like uh, resources, like uh, like uh, easy composites in the UK, you can visit their website. They have like, uh, like materials that are ready to ship. Uh, also, uh, I provided the, like the natural fiber composite directory. Okay. Uh, some of the like interesting, like uh, suppliers of raw materials include B Comp. Okay. Uh, also uh, a French company, it's called the, Eco Technilin, okay. Uh, this is another uh, company that, or is it I think it, uh, that's the name, yes. Uh, Encave, Encave is another company that works extensively with natural fiber composites. So, uh, so the third question, do you have experience with different silane treatment for improved composites? Honestly, no. Uh, I mostly worked with thermoplastics uh, polypropylene, and again, I mean, because this is the major, like, uh, the major commercial use for composites is natural fiber composites is mixed with polypropylene matrix for the natural, for the automotive industry. Uh, the Malik anhydride is excellent, it's, it's very effective, okay, but you have to be careful with the treatment. It's better to have, like, like, emaliated polypropylene uh, than treating the natural fibers, okay? Uh, how can we download this great presentation? So I'm sure that uh, Tommaso will share with you the recording and also I will provide the PDF of the presentation so you can use it for future reference, okay? Uh, how, can, how can the finished parts protected against moisture water absorption? Okay, this is a tricky question. Uh, it's not easy, okay? Uh, you know, even, even if you cover it with like gel coats or any protective coats, um, you know, any scratches or damages will still allow the moisture to like penetrate into the system. Uh, like some of those treatments, like for instance, the Malik and Hydride, the Silane, uh, they also tend to lower the moisture absorption of natural fibers. Uh, but this is one of the like the challenges that I would say has not been resolved yet. How to like make a hydrophobic natural fiber? Uh, okay. So does natural fiber saturate with more resin and make the product heavier? Yes, this is true, especially for 
like uh, thermal setting resin. And, and you've seen, I mean, there are specific like uh, natural fibers that have like uh, large hollow content. They have like those lumens or cavities. So they tend to entrap resin. Uh, I mean, we just need the resin to be surrounding the fiber, but they end up entering into those cavities. Uh, so this is another challenge, perhaps using, you know, like, uh, or tuning the, like the viscosity of the resin, you might be able to avoid like this oversaturation of the uh, fiber with the resin. And also, you know, with consolidation pressure, higher consolidation pressure, you can squeeze out like any excess resin. Okay. Uh, can natural fibers used, be used in UAV airframes? Uh, what's UAV? I think it's, uh, yeah, I remember this term. I think UAV are like, uh, like certain types of vehicles that are used for recreational purposes, like people who are traveling. Uh, oh, it's airframes. So I don't want to <laughs> answer a wrong question. Uh, Still, uh, unfortunately, I don't know exactly what's UAV. So uh, I'll skip this question. Sorry about that. <laughs> so difference between preform and prepreg. So preform is a term that is intended to describe uh, an intermediate form of a textile reinforcement that would be subsequently used in the composite manufacturing. You know, uh, a prepreg is a type of a preform. So it's a preform that is pre-impregnated with the resin. Okay. So we can have dry preforms. We can have like, so there are hundred percent fibers that are still need to be impregnated with the resin, but we have like pre-impregnated preforms that already have the resin impregnated in them. Okay. Uh, what is the best thermoset resin to have the best environmental impact? Uh, I already answered this question. Uh, I would say the like the the bio-based epoxy, okay, with the up to thirty-five percent, uh, up to thirty-five percent uh, bio-based uh, content, is considered the like the optimum. Uh, beyond this, you will start getting like degradation in the performance. There are like if you want to have like the ultimate environmental impact, so you can go for like the 50% bio-based content. Uh, I mean, there are, there are like fully bio-based resin, uh, but they're not like commercialized, like, uh, like on a commercial level. Uh, and their performance is really very low or they are very expensive. So, so that's why they are not still able to commercialize those solutions. Uh, but if you're interested in like, a good bio-based uh, thermos, thermoplastic. So PLA is a good choice. PHA is also a good choice, but PHA is even more expensive. What about using natural fiber in a powder form? Any potential and future of this form? Yes. Uh, so this is a very qu good question. So earlier in the presentation, I said that uh, like the term biocomposites, it describes both like, uh, wood plastic composite as well as uh, natural fiber composites. So what, what's wood plastic composites? So these are composites made with fine particles, fine wood particles like sawdust mill or even natural fibers that are chopped into very short length uh, in, in more of a, in a powder or particle form. So the problem with uh, powder form is that I mean, you can use them as a filler, but they will not like really provide good enhancement to the performance. So if you're looking for like a reinforcing effect, you will not get this reinforcing effect with powder for several reasons. The first reason, they have low aspect ratio, okay? And this is an important parameter in like transferring the load from the matrix to the fiber. And since, you know, like, natural fibers, they already, they are not bonding well with the matrix. So, and also you have short fibers. So this become very, like it's making things worse. But if you just want to, you know, like substitute a certain percentage of the plastic with a certain percentage with the 
uh, bio-based fibers. So this is acceptable, but you will not get any like enhancement in the performance. But in terms of like natural fibers that are used as a textile preform in a long fiber length, uh, Yes, even though they don't have very good adhesion, interfacial adhesion with the polymer matrix. However, so the, so the load transfer is not very good. However, the textile nature of this preform is also contributing to the contributing to the load transfer. You know, like uh, like uh, woven fabrics or non-woven fabrics, they already have integrity and they can transfer the load. So if we use them as powder. Uh, but I mean, it's a, it's it's definitely a very fast growing market. I will just uh, go back to my slides and show you the market share for this. Uh, they are sold as granulated, and they are among the fastest growing uh, market share in the natural fiber or the bio based composites. Okay, so the so the green the green uh, like uh, the green type represents the like the bio-based composites traded in granules. So these are like, uh, like you know, uh, like granules that are made of like uh, thermoplastics and uh, like short natural fibers or wood fibers, okay? Uh, so they are growing very fast because they are, you know, like an off the shelf, off the shelf, uh, like solution, you can easily add them to your injection molding operation or their extrusion. So uh, they're easy to, they are very compatible. This is why they are growing fast. Okay. Uh, can we use other synthetic fibers alongside natural fibers to make them better? Or will that ruin the whole purpose of natural fibers? Uh, I think uh, hybridization is the way forward. Uh, I mean, you know, every type of material has its own limitations. And I would say that even like composites have been developed from its early inception to blend different types of materials together to like, you know, to mix and match different benefits and features of different fibers. And this is completely acceptable. I mean, uh, you can like use, and, and I've seen like some uh, like companies that have been developing the sun, like the sunroof of their cars made of uh, like carbon fiber and the uh, like uh, flax. And they were comparing it with the 100% carbon fiber. And they said they ha it has like better skid properties. So yes, it's something that is def definitely the way forward. Natural fibers are one of the key elements towards circular economy. Do you think that focus should also be directed at finding more sustainable matrix material alternatives? Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, I think this is the, um, th this is the challenge nowadays. If we do like, like natural fiber composites with a like um, synthetic polymer, yes, you can get like, if it's a, uh, you can get like a large content, after all, bio-based content. You can get like a reduction in like carbon footprint emissions, uh, but maybe you cannot get like this biodegradability of the composite itself at the end of the life. Uh, maybe you cannot uh, get recyclability unless it's a thermoplastic. So that's why thermoplastic are more interesting because at least if, you, if it will not degrade 100%, at least you can recycle it and it can go through several successive lives of recycling. Uh, I would still retain very good performance. Okay, have you worked on thermoset bio-based resin? Uh, no, not really. I, I never used it, uh, but I, I use regular uh, resin, but I think like that's what people are saying. I mean, or companies are claiming they're just like regular, similar to any like uh, like uh, epoxy or unsaturated polyester. Uh, I mean, after all, they are epoxy resin, okay? So you use them with the hardener. Uh, I think you have to be careful with the pot life and uh, the drying is very important. Otherwise it will take very long to uh, the drying of the fibers. The pre-drying of the fiber is very important. Otherwise it will take long time to cure. Uh, do you have an overview of natural yarn supplier? Um, 
So uh, it depends. So uh, I don't have like many top of my head. There is a company called Proco, Procotex in France supplying the flags. There is a company in France also, it's called Eco Techni Lin uh, in France. Uh, I don't know, like uh, Jude, there are lots. I mean, if you, if you like search online for Jude, you will find lots of traders and suppliers of jute from Bangladesh. Uh, but I mean, the fact that they are not intentionally developed for this end use, they might have, they might need to be like, you know, cleaned or washed or like slightly tuned. Uh, okay, is natural fiber really a continuous fiber? Uh, yes, <laughs> I would say yes. So, you know, whenever, it's not a continuous fiber, I'm sorry. It's a long fiber. So whenever we're like, like we're dealing with the mechanics of composites, we classify composites into long fiber composites and short fiber composites. And the, I mean, the, the most defining feature of whether it's a long fiber or a short fiber is the aspect ratio. And there is, you know, is a, there is a critical aspect ratio. Like uh, if you go below this aspect ratio, it will be considered like uh, short fibers. And generally, like the length up, like beyond like two centimeters or three centimeters, these are considered long fibers. I mean, some fibers like flax and sistal and uh, like abaca, they can be as long as like one meter long, or even like abaca can be as long as two meters. Okay, but the fact that they cannot be processed uh, in such long length, uh, so yes, they can be long, but not continuous. The only continuous natural fiber is silk. Silk is the only continuous natural fiber. It's a filament, uh, not a fiber. UAV is unmanned aircraft vehicle. Oh, thank you. Can we use natural fibers in aircraft structures? Uh, so uh, I've seen some attempts by Boeing to make interior, interior components like the side wall, coverings like the like overhead compartment bins, uh, even like some like the cart, uh, the carts used for transporting food inside the like the the, the aircraft. Uh, but I haven't seen anything used like in the like uh, in the outer structure itself. Uh, but perhaps you know like there are certain factors like the UV that needs to be considered. I've seen, like, as I said, I mean, there are certain suppliers that are providing bio-based resin, even with higher UV, with uh, like uh, flame retardancy. So this is, could be something to investigate. Uh, I mean, you've seen the application of the, like the natural fiber composite nacelle that is like, it's built in the, the Netherlands. So I would say it's, if it works, it's still in a test program. So if it succeeded, I would say that like unmanned air vehicles, aircraft vehicles might succeed. Uh, can we reuse the natural fiber reinforcement after enzymatic recycling? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I would say that enzymatic recycling, is it intended to like, so because uh, I know like enzymatic, like recycling might involve like, uh, like uh, introducing enzymes to, you know, either accelerate the biodegradation of the fiber or perhaps attack certain constituents in the fiber, but I'm not sure how it's recycled using enzymatic recycling. Sorry, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the answer. Uh, is it possible to mold natural fiber on spray layup process? Uh, I've seen, it's a company that has been in the business for some time, but now they're out of business. Uh, it's called, it was called Sun Strands. It was based in Kentucky. Uh, they used to like make uh, different types of natural fibers, including bamboo, uh, but they had certain videos showing like uh, spray up, hand spray up of natural fibers. I don't think that there's a problem with this. I mean. Uh, as I said, natural fibers can be processed in most of the composite manufacturing processes, but uh, still needs to be like uh, investigated. <laughs> is a solution of recyclable thermoset biocomp is, is a solution of recyclable thermoset biocomposites? 
Uh, so regular thermoset biocomposites are not recyclable, uh, but recently I, I've seen several uh, attempts to develop what, what's called reversible thermosets, okay? So these are thermosets that after the cross-linking and after the curing, they can be broken down into the liquid state and you can get the reinforcements, but you cannot recover, like you cannot reuse this thermoset liquid again in, in making matrix, but at least you get the reinforcement. Uh, but still, most of these are like in, you know, in uh, like uh, early inception stages. Uh, so I think now that we've answered all questions, um, thank you so much for your active engagement and participation. It was really a pleasure being here with you this evening. Uh, I hope it was like a rewarding experience for you, for your time and for staying late. Uh, what is the most researched topic in natural fiber? Uh, that's a tough question. Uh, so as I said, I mean, like uh, nowadays, one of the trends is uh, like finding alternative sources of natural fibers, including agriculture, biomass. Another important research is, uh, I forget to say about this, is the all cellulose composites. You know, vegetable fibers are made of cellulose. Okay, so uh, there, and you, you must read about this. Uh, nowadays, people are making like uh, those cellulose reinforcements and using certain like chemicals to dissolve, partly dissolve the cellulose on the surface of the fiber, and then, you know, pressing them and curing them. And then you would, so this partly dissolved cellulose, it would eventually act as a matrix. So you end up having all cellulose composite. So the, the reinforcement is a cellulose fiber and the matrix is a cellulose uh, matrix. So I think this could be also an interesting topic for investigation. Uh, not a question, but thanks so much for your very great presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really happy to be here with you and looking forward for more uh, like, like webinars like this. And if you have any questions later on, you can reach out to me. Thank you so much. Uh, let me go back to my presentation. So uh, I think we're ready to conclude the session. Yes, indeed. Well, thanks, Mohamed. That was quite a few questions, but congrats on, on answering, answering all of them. And yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining, for all your questions, your participation, your feedback. I've been reading the chat while Professor Mohamed was um, presenting. And yeah, thank you very much for the feedback. That, that is great. And as I said, if you have any questions um, regarding the webinar or composites in general, you can contact us, the Native Lab, through info at the native lab .com. And uh, Mohamed Midani also shared his, his mail. The recording of this webinar will be shared. Um, you will have more information in the follow-up mail um, and also the presentation, we, we can share it. Um, so you will, we'll have access to it. And and that, that would be it then for today. And in a minute, I'll be closing the webinar. And once I do that, a survey will pop up. So if you are so kind to fill it in, that would be great. So we can have some feedback on yes. how, how we did, how the, how the webinar went and, and if you enjoyed it. So thanks also, Mohamed, for joining. It was a bit longer than uh, we predicted, but that's completely fine as long as everyone enjoyed. And yes, hopefully there will be some other occasions to talk about natural fiber composites. So thank you very much. Have a good evening or a good day, depending from where you are on this planet and, and hope to see you another time and have a good Christmas time, at least for those who read it. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. <laughs>